The history of recorded sound has always fascinated me. And in many ways, the idea that music or spoken word could be physically inscribed into the tiny grooves of a piece of polyvinyl plastic, or even a piece of tinfoil, which could be played back to replicate the precise sounds recorded, is for me far more mind-blowing than a computer simply reading countless ones and zeros. Devices such as mechanical music boxes had been around since the 1700s, and though were not able to record sound directly, used revolving drum cylinders or discs to plug the pre-tuned teeth of a metallic comb to reproduce musical chimes on demand. An impressive feat at the time, but their creation required careful and precise tuning and offered limited playback of simple musical melodies. Other types of automated music reproduction can be found as far back as the 9th century when the Banu Musa brothers invented the earliest known mechanical musical instrument a water-powered organ that played interchangeable cylinders, and this is believed to have remained the basic device to produce and reproduce music mechanically until the 19th century. What you're about to hear was, up until 2008, believed to be the earliest recording of the human voice in existence. It is the voice of America's greatest inventor, Thomas Edison, as he recites the children's poem, Mary Had a Little Lamb recorded onto a sheet of tinfoil using his newly invented phonograph in 1877. A later version of this recording is often mistakenly cited as being this original. In fact, the clip that you're about to see was recorded decades later in 1927 to mark the 50th anniversary of Edison's original recording. The original phonograph. A little piece of practical poetry. Mary had a little lamb, its feet was quite as slow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Despite the fact that the accompanying video is clearly not from 1877, and that Edison states, the first words I spoke into the original phonogram before going on to recite the poem again. Many sources still cite this clip as the original recording, which it is not. The original clip also featured a short coronet solo, as well as Edison laughing before also reciting Old Mother Hubbard, as you'll hear now. But on March 27, 2008, everything we thought we knew about the earliest recorded human voice changed after the discovery of a vault in Paris, which uncovered the following recording, made in 1859, almost 20 years before Edison's. This eerie voice of a woman singing the French folk song El Clair de la Lune shocked the historic and scientific community. But who was this mysterious woman, and had she really beaten Edison to record the first ever human voice? We'll come back to her shortly. After some of his experimental work with early telephone devices a few years prior, Thomas Edison concluded that if he could record the movements of a diaphragm properly, he could cause such records to reproduce the original movements imparted to that diaphragm by a voice and thus succeed in recording and reproducing human speech. Up until 2008, Edison's phonograph was believed to be the first attempt to record airborne sound. It used a cylindrical grooved drum with tinfoil temporarily wrapped around it as the recording media. The user would speak loudly into the opening at the front of the device, which in turn had a diaphragm located at the bottom end. While the cylinder was rotated and slowly progressed along its axis, the airborne sound vibrated the diaphragm, which was in turn connected to a stylus that indented the foil into the cylinder's groove, thereby recording the vibrations as variations of depth in the indentation. The playback process was then achieved by simply repeating the recording procedure backwards. The difference being that the recorded foil now served to vibrate the stylus, which in turn transmitted its vibrations back to the diaphragm and outward through the opening and back into the air as audible sound. 
These early tinfoil recordings were incredibly delicate and were later replaced by wax cylinders. Any surviving sheets today simply cannot be played back through the same means, as they'd simply crumble to pieces. So in recent years, methods to optically scan these original recordings to then digitally play them back have been developed, allowing us to hear these incredible recordings in their original form without any risk of further damage to these important historical artifacts. But on March 27, 2008, a discovery made in a vault at the Society of Encouragement for National Development in Paris changed everything we thought we knew about the first recorded voice in history when audio historians uncovered a collection of phonautograms dated 1857. They were created by a man named Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville. Martinville was a French printer and bookseller by trade. He was born on the 25th of April 1817 and by 1849 had developed a keen interest in stenography, a shorthand or symbolic writing method used to increase the speed at which one can write or take notes. By 1853, he became fascinated with the idea of a mechanical means of transcribing human speech and was keen to develop a new technology for stenography, a way to visually transcribe audio so that it could be stored and analysed in a visual form. He became inspired when he happened to read about the autonomy of the human ear in a paper he was printing and set about creating his device, which he named the phonautograph. After the invention of photography just a few decades earlier, he wrote, if photography could capture fleeting images with lenses moulded on the eye, might not a replica of the ear similarly capture spoken words? Might a stenographic instrument placed between two men transcribe their conversation in minute detail, regardless of their speed of conversation? Might a writer dictate a fleeting dream in the middle of the night, and upon wakening find not only that it has been written, but rejoice in his freedom from the pen? that instrument that struggles with and chills expression. His phonautograph was constructed as an analogue of the ear canal, eardrum and isosceles. The functions of the ear canal and eardrum were simulated by a funnel-like horn with a flexible membrane of parchment stretched over the small end. A pig or hog's bristle connected to the membrane served as an amplifying lever and the bristle traced a line through a thin coating of soot on a moving surface of paper or soot paper placed over a cylindrical drum, much like Edison's future device. The sound collected by the simulated ear and transmitted to the bristle caused the line to be modulated in accordance with the passing variations in air pressure, creating a graphical record of the sound waves. The resulting phonautograms, as they were known, were of course two-dimensional, as no indentations were being made in the paper. They were merely a graphical representation. The crude angle at which the pig bristle ran along the paper, coupled with the fact that it was often not making constant contact, meant that the waveforms were incomplete and irregular. But this was not a problem for de Martinville. He had never intended for these waveforms to be audibly played back. Perhaps the idea seemed impossible even to himself at the time. He believed that if a stenographer could learn to read such seemingly bizarre and complex shorthand notes as easily as printed words on a page, then could his self-written words in soot perhaps one day be read so easily too? The earliest form of a dictaphone. He managed to sell a handful of phonautographs to scientific laboratories for use in the investigation of sound. It proved useful in the study of vowel sounds and also initiated further research into tools able to image sound, such as Koenig's manometric flame. He was not, however, able to profit from his invention and spent the remainder of his life as a bookseller dealing in prints and photographs, seemingly unaware of his achievement. When news broke about the discovery of the phonautograms in Paris more than 150 years later, within two days of their finding, scientists at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California were able to use digital imaging technology to optically scan and convert these two-dimensional waveforms into digital audio. You can watch an incredible video about the restoration process from one of the audio historians who made the discovery. His channel is linked above and in the description below. The resulting clip first appeared to be 10 seconds long and featured a woman singing the French folk song El Clair de la Lune. But months later in 2009, it was discovered that de Martinville had recorded a 425 hertz timecode on his tracks as a pitch reference, which meant that the audio was being played too fast. 
when this was eventually corrected, it was revealed the clip was actually twice as long and was not a woman, but a man singing, believed to be and later confirmed as Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville himself. Sadly, de Martinville died without any knowledge that his voice will likely remain the oldest and first ever recording of a human voice in our existence. In his memoir, written a year before his death in 1879, de Martinville scorned his American rival Edison and made brazen appeals to French nationalism. What are the rights of the discoverer versus the improver? Come, Parisians, don't let them take our prize. During the same year, Edison had traveled to Washington to exhibit his phonograph and to meet with the president. It is here he was said to have visited the Smithsonian, where it is claimed he first learned about de Martinville's phonograph. Reportedly, he was impressed, but surprised that someone would invent such a machine and not think of playing back the recording out loud. Edison later died in October of 1931 and went to his grave believing that he was the first man to ever record airborne sound. And while he was in fact the first to ever hear recorded audio out loud, 150 years and some incredible science would see the oldest recorded voice in our existence to be that of Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville. <laughs>